Good morning and welcome to the STS-119 Spacewalk Overview Briefing. Today to tell us about the four spacewalks of that mission, we have the lead spacewalk officer for the mission, Glenda Laws brown And after she walks us through the spacewalks, we'll take some questions. Glenda. Hello everyone and welcome. Uh, on STS-119, the 15A assembly mission, we have four spacewalks. They'll be conducted on flight days 5, 7, 9, and 11. Our spacewalkers for the mission are EV-1, Steve Swanson, EV-2, Ricky Arnold, EV-3, Joe Acaba, and they'll be supporting one another in the IV or intervehicular support role. Uh, when two of them are outside, the third one inside will be supporting them, reading through their procedures and letting them know what's up next. Um, They'll be supported through their suit up, or suiting up operations by uh, the pilot on the mission, Tony Antonelli, and the robotics operators uh, will be John Phillips and Koichi Wakata. They'll be supporting them uh, throughout the EVAs as well. From the ground, they'll be supported by the mission control team led by lead flight director Koichi, or, uh, Kwasi Alaburujo. Uh, myself and my team, who've all been putting in a lot of hours in the past few weeks getting ready for this mission, certifying that we're ready for these EVAs. And that's Jackie Kage, Dave Simon, John Malarski, Dave Oswald, and Sabrina Singh. And I want to take this moment to thank them very much for all of their support and their contributions. Um, with that, we can get right into what you guys are all here to see, uh, and it's the videos of our four spacewalks. And we can start with EVA-1. If you could roll that tape, please. Here we are at the beginning of flight day five. Um, our crew members will be getting suited up inside the space station in the Quest airlock, while the uh, two robotics operators will be using the robot arm to move the S6 element into position for its mating with the S5 element. The EV crew will get set up in position to monitor as the robotics operators bring the uh, S6 element into position. They'll make a couple of stops on the way at 30 centimeters and at 15 centimeters to check for final alignment before bringing it into place, checking that the alignment cones and the have come completely into the alignment cups and are ready for driving the attachment system bolts. The EV crew will actuate the um, capture claw that will hold the two elements together uh, during the time that they go around to each of the four corners and actuate the four attachment system bolts. Following that, they'll be moving on to mating the umbilicals. They have two power and two data umbilicals that need to be mated. Here you see uh, Steve Swanson in the neutral buoyancy laboratory during training mating one of the uh, data connections between the S5 element and the S6 element on the left. Um, <clears throat> As he's working on that, EV2 is going around and uh, securing the um, um, grounding straps between the, the two elements, one on each of the four corners. And from there, he'll take a foot restraint out to the outboard end of the S6 element onto the integrated electronics assembly or IEA portion of the S6. He'll install the foot restraint and get set up to release the launch restraint bolts on the solar array blanket boxes. The uh, uh, blanket boxes are held in place by two launch restraints. The inboard, there are two bolts that hold those into posi position. Uh, here you can see them in the neutral buoyancy laboratory uh, using his power tool and torque multiplier to reach down between the two blanket boxes to release the high torque fasteners and then to rotate those inboard launch restraints out of the way. He'll then reposition his foot restraint to work on the outboard launch restraints. That launch restraint is a clamshell type of mechanism held in place by six high torque bolts. Uh, he'll use the torque multiplier and power tool again to release the, that uh, launch restraint and then um, uh, release the clamshell for stowage in the S6 stowage bin. Here we see uh, what EV1 Steve Swanson will be doing at the same time. He'll be working on releasing the cinch bolts. There are six of those that hold the photovoltaic radiator into position for launch. Uh, there are six of the cinch bolts and two winch bars that need to be removed and moved out of the way to enable the ground 
control team to command the deploy of that radiator, which will happen near the end of the EVA or possibly right after EVA-1. When EV-2 is finished with the launch restraint bolts on uh, one side of the integrated electronics assembly, he'll move to the other side um, and work on first the inboard launch restraints and then again the outboard launch restraints. Again, removing the clamshell from the outboard launch uh, restraints for the blanket boxes and positioning that for later stowage in the stow bin of the S6. When he's finished using his foot restraint, he'll move it out of the way so that the uh, blanket boxes can uh, be uh, deployed with the uh, mass canister on the solar array wing. EV-1 will come over and rotate the keel pin assembly out of the way so that will leave a clear sweep envelope as uh, the solar array blanket or solar arrays uh, wings are deployed. Those solar array wings are held into place uh, for launch well, with two launch restraint bolts called the beta gimbal assembly launch restraint bolts. When those two bolts are released, it allows the linkage that holds the mass canister uh, called the four bar linkage because there are four bars linking it to the main portion of the S6. The uh, two beta gimbal restraint bolts will re be released and that mass canister can swing out and up or down into position so that the blanket boxes can then be deployed in preparation for solar array deploy that actually happens later in the mission, uh, most likely on flight day eight. Uh, when one of the mass canisters is in position, the beta gimbal restraints of the other mass canister will be released, allowing that four bar linkage to deploy and lock into position. When the uh, mass canisters and four bars are locked into position, the crew members can crawl up onto the top of the mass canisters and deploy the blanket boxes into their final position, first the right side and then the left side. When they've completed one of the uh, mass canister solar array blanket box uh, positionings, they'll move to the other one. And uh, they'll do a final verification that the uh, pit pins are in place to hold those as well as the mechanism locking uh, restraint. What you see flashing right there are the SSU and ECUs of one of the mass canisters, and here in the NBL, you see them removing the thermal covers from those elements. As long as the ground control team has enough time and power to get the um, element activated, those thermal blankets will no longer be required and they can be removed uh, in preparation for deploy of the solar arrays. Should they not accomplish that task on this EVA, it can be picked up at the beginning of the second EVA. They have uh, one get ahead task that they can get done at the end if they have time or really any time during the EVA uh, as long as we are on time or ahead of the nominal timeline. And that get ahead task is to release the torque on the four fasteners of the MMOD shield or micrometeor deploy, I'm sorry, debris shield that is on the IEA. Uh, that shield uh, is torqued down uh, with fairly high torque for launch and the, uh, that uh, torque needs to be released uh, to relieve loads on that um, element for the rest of the life of the station. That's the end of EVA-1 and uh, the crew members will gather up their tools, head back into the airlock uh, at about the same time the um, radiator can be deployed. I wanted to show you just a couple of uh, pieces of hardware from that EVA. Uh, the first thing that I want to show you is right here. It's the uh, attach sy system. Uh, this is one of the mechanisms from one of the four corners. This is a high fidelity trainer that we have, a, a qualification testing unit. What you can see here are at the end the primary bolt that bolts the uh, the S five portion and the S6 portion of the interface together. You can also see secondary fasteners. Uh, there's one here and one is removed over on the other side. Those secondary fasteners can be used should the primary bolt fail. There is a gap check tool uh, which is held in place by a bolt right here. This whole portion here can come up, out and help to check for gaps 
um, should the um, elements not come into alignment um, as we like them, uh, we'll check what gap there is and then make corrections accordingly. Uh, finally, there is the uh, grounding strap. Uh, it's secured with a bolt uh, here. This is showing its final configuration, or, I'm sorry, its launch configuration. It will be moved here from the S6 side and bolted onto the S5 side to allow grounding between the enti entire um, uh, elements of the uh, space station. That uh, wanted to I brought a couple, uh, a couple of the tools along today, and one that we'll be using on EVA-1 is a torque wrench. Uh, this is similar to a torque wrench you might find in any shop. Uh, we use uh, uh, sockets that have special interfaces on them called um, um, drop-proof tether sockets. They have an interface on them that allows you to remove and replace them using a pit pin with a tether on it to move them the sockets from one interface to another. The uh, socket needed is a 5 8 inch socket uh, for the primary bolt that you saw on the RTAS uh, attachment system. Okay, that's uh, all I have right now for EVA-1, so we can roll the EVA-2 video. EVA-2 will be conducted on flight day seven. The crew members for this EVA are EV-1 Steve Swanson and EV-3 Joe Acaba. Their uh, first task will be to uh, egress the Quest airlock and translate over to the top of the U.S. laboratory module where we have a couple of foot restraints stowed. They'll collect, each collect a foot restraint and put it on their body restraint tether uh, for translation out to the far side of the International Space Station to the P6 element, which is way at the other end of the station from where they were working on EVA-1. They'll translate out past the port SARGE or solar array rotary joint. That joint will have to be locked uh, until they've completed task on the outboard elements. Their first task is in support of preparations for the 2JA mission, which will be uh, flying later this year. They'll pos position two foot restraints <clears throat> and uh, a couple of gap spanners for um, support of body restraint and translation uh, across the Integrated Electronics Assembly, or IEA, uh, where the six batteries that will be changed out on the 2JA mission are located. You can see here the handrails for one of the gap spanners and the handrails for the second gap spanner that will span the deck of the IEA as they do their work. On STS-119, our crew will be releasing the high torque on the bolts of the six batteries that will be changed out on the later mission. Those bolts are torqued down to 55 foot-pounds for launch, and in order to make sure that they're each, um, uh, the torque can be bo broken and they are ready to go for uh, removal and replacement on the next mission, our crew will be using a ratchet wrench to break the torque on each one of the two bolts on each of the six batteries. Um, when they are finished with this portion of the EVA, they'll pack up their tools and translate back inboard uh, across the port SARGE uh, to their next task, which is deployment of the UCAS, or Universal Cargo Carrier Attach System. This UCAS will be used on the ULF-3 mission to position an external logistics carrier um, that will provide spare, spare parts for uh, maintenance on the ISS for the duration of the program. In order to deploy this UCAS, there are two braces that need to be removed that provide structural support to the SARGE and the outboard elements. That's the SARGE brace that you see moving there and the diagonal brace across that uh, section of the P3 element. They'll be moved out of the way so that the UCAS can be moved out of its launch location inside the S3, and then the braces have to be put back into location, bolted back, the diagonal SAR and the SARGE brace both bolted into location before the yoke of the UCAS can be brought down into its final location 
and mated to the deploy clevis bracket using an adjustable diameter pin and a pip pin to hold it in place as well as the four fasteners that secure the deploy clevis bracket to the S3 element. When they're finished with that task, the uh, port sarge can be allowed to rotate, again tracking the sun to provide power for the International Space Station. Next they'll move over to the radiator beam valve module of the P3 or P1 element. On that module there is a small thermal cover, uh, we also refer to those as thermal booties, covering one of the fluid quick disconnects that has come loose. We'll be resecuring the Velcro uh, or using a wire tie as was shown in that uh, neutral buoyancy laboratory training footage. From there, the crew moves over to the uh, P1, P3 fluid contingency jumper location. They'll be moving that jumper from a stowage location and deploying it across the, S, uh, the P1, P3 interface. That jumper is used in the contingency case where ammonia has leaked out of the outboard elements and needs to be refilled from the ammonia tank assemblies that are on the P1 element. Their final P1 task for this EVA is to release some launch restraints on the flex hose rotary coupler fluid lines. Those fluid lines are held in place by launch restraints called P-clamps. There are four of those to be released um, on each of the Zenith and Nader locations uh, for the um, outboard li fluid line um, fluid lines of the HF FHRC and uh, several more on the inboard side or the stinger side of the FHRC. Um, that completes the task on the port side of the International Space Station. From here the crew will be translating uh, back on the starboard side for uh, another deploy of an element that's very similar to the UCAS. It's actually called a PAS or payload attached system. Uh, to you and I uh, and the EV crew members, the interfaces look exactly the same on a UCAS as they do on a PAS. Um, and the operations are the same. Removing the Sarge and diagonal brace to get them out of the way, followed by deploying the PAS from inside the S3 element to outside and then reattaching the diagonal brace and sarge brace. Finally bringing the yoke of the PAS assembly down into position to the deploy clevis bracket, securing it with an adjustable diameter pin and a pit pin and the four fasteners on the deploy clevis bracket. Both the P3 UCAS and the S3 Zenith outboard PAS will be used on the ULF-3 mission. Their final task is to move a tool stanchion on, from the Z1 element down to the lab and to retrieve the foot restraint uh, from the Z1 element that that tool stanchion was held in and bring it back inside. It has a thermal shield on it that is causing interference with some of the uh, worksite interfaces that the foot restraint is used in. That small thermal shield uh, has been deemed unnecessary and will be removed between the EVAs and brought back, that foot restraint can be brought back out again on EVA 3 uh, to be used in uh, nominal operations. The crew translates back to the Quest airlock and are completed with EVA 2 operations. Um, again, I have some hardware to show you from um, that's used on that uh, EVA. Uh, the first thing that I wanted to show you that I don't believe that you've seen before is the gap spanner. Uh, there are French hooks at each end of a long piece of beta glass cloth. Uh, that beta glass cloth uh, has a buckle uh, for adjustment in between so you can attach the two hooks, one on either side of the IEA in this case and then uh, tighten the strap uh, so that you can have a good translation path uh, across the uh, 
the interface. The other thing that I wanted to show you was uh, some flex hose. This uh, is an example of uh, the flexi flexible hose that's used to transport all of the various fluids on board the International Space Station, including the ammonia that's transferred during uh, in the uh, S S1 and P1 to S3, P3 um, elements for contingency fluid line jumping for the um, ammonia system. You can see at this end of it the fluid quick disconnect that is used to connect to the uh, truss element. Okay. So with that, uh, we're ready to begin EVA 3. So if you could roll that video, please. All right. Here we are on uh, flight day 9, preparing for EVA 3. The EV crew members will be um, EV 2, Ricky Arnold, and EV 3, Joe Acaba. Their first task is to relocate a CETA cart from the port side of the mobile transporter to the starboard side of the mobile transporter. That will allow the mobile transporter to go as far port as possible uh, in support of the 2JA mission where they will be removing and replacing several batteries on the P6 element. The two crew members work together. They'll move a foot restraint off of the CETA cart and onto the robotic arm. The robotic arm will be uh, positioned by the crew members inside, uh, Phillips and Wakata. Outside, uh, Akaba will be holding onto the um, CETA cart while EV2 Arnold goes around and releases each of the four wheel bogies that hold it into position on the MT CETA rails of the International Space Station. The arm will move crew member Akaba and the CETA cart from the port side to the starboard side, where the CETA cart will be reinstalled onto the MT CETA rails and then reconnected to the starboard side of the mobile transporter. When they're completed with that task, uh, crew member Arnold and Akaba will switch positions. Arnold will uh, ingress the foot restraint on the shuttle or on the station's robotic arm, and then uh, the robotic arm will be positioned uh, for his first task uh, as an arm-based crew member. The, that task is to configure some thermal blankets on the Dexter robotic manipulator, uh, also referred to as the, by the flight control team as the SPDM. There are several uh, blankets uh, that need to be reconfigured on the OTCM, uh, which is the hand portion of the Dexter. There's um, a couple of thermal blankets uh, around um, the arm portion and then a couple along the cuff and we'll call it two more around the mitten portion of the uh, Dexter um, thermal cover. When they're completed with uh, those reconfigurations, they'll move over to the main body of the Dexter and remove the electronics platform one EP1 thermal cover. That thermal cover um, will be removed and stowed to be brought back inside. Then the arm will be maneuvered into position near the S0 element where crew member Arnold will remove the foot restraint from the arm and position it on the S0 for his next task, which is performing some maintenance on the end effector of the station robotic arm. He'll take the foot restraint off and uh, set it up and then ingress that foot restraint so that he has access to look into the end of the end effector uh, and apply some lubricant and then actuate the end effector snares to uh, correct um, the configuration of that element. You can see crew member Arnold in the NBL in position to do that task. And here out at building nine with uh, Steve Swanson and Ricky Arnold uh, looking at the high fidelity mock-up that we have of this interface showing where the lubricant needs to be positioned using the uh, grease gun. And um, 
using the tool, one of the tools that they'll be uh, using during their EVA. This is called a gap gauge, uh, used for some other purposes, but in this case used to help um, pull the snares out of the groove that they normally live in, and uh, then using the um, needle nose plier, they'll manipulate those snares to get them freed up to operate uh, in their originally um, uh, conceived configuration. Well, crew member Arnold is on the arm working on the Dexter, <clears throat> excuse me, the Dexter um, thermal cover and the um, end effector lubrication. Crew member Akaba will be working on the starboard side of the truss, um, taking care of a few tasks that uh, have been outstanding. The first of which is um, changing the configuration of the segment to segment attach system of the S1 to S3 interface. He'll be moving some connectors to their final configuration. And from there, <clears throat> he'll be moving over to complete the contingency fluid line jumper uh, relocation from its um, launch configuration to the S1 to S3 um, fluid line connections uh, to allow for contingency refill of fluid outboard to the outboard elements. From there, he goes back to the FHRC on the starboard side and does the same type of P-clamp releases that were completed on uh, EVA-2 on the port side. When he's completed with those tasks, or at such time when we have the inhibits in place uh, to perform the first of two RPCM, or remote power control module uh, replacements. He'll move over to the S0 and open a uh, sliding door that provides access to the bank of RPCMs that um, provide uh, command and control to several of the S0 um, elements. He'll be replacing the second one from the left in that bank, so he'll be keeping close track of which serial numbers he's removing and replacing to make sure that we get the correct one. When he's complete with that task, he'll slide the access cover closed and move on to the final task, which is a second RPCM, or remote power control module, um, replacement. This is on the P1 element. That bank of RPCMs is located in phase one of the P1 element. Um, he'll be working on replacing um, that RPCM. Both the RPCMs replaced on this EVA have element or small uh, component failures um, that are taking out redundancy to several of the uh, items that they control, those RPCMs will be brought back to the ground and refurbished, taken back to the International Space Station to be used on uh, future missions uh, for replacement of any later failures. And that's the configuration at the end of our EVA-3. Um, on flight day, uh, nine, and you can see here that the solar array has been deployed uh, on flight day eight. Okay, the, uh, I have a couple of pieces of hardware that I wanted to show you uh, in conjunction with that EVA, the first of which is the uh, grease gun. I think you saw this before um, when we uh, showed it to you on the ULF-2 mission. It has a thermal cover on it that can be uh, removed from the tip. There's a valve that needs to be uh, configured right here on uh, near the tip that allows the grease to flow out. This uh, works a lot like a cock gun that you would have in your home. It's got a plunger mechanism. It has a cartridge that's full of uh, brake coat lubricant and you use the trigger mechanism just as you would uh, in a home caulking job to apply grease in this case to the end effector of the uh, station robotic arm. Um, 
Something that I didn't show you last time on the flex hose was the P-clamp or the launch restraint that I was telling you about. You'll notice that it's a bolt interface that springs up. Uh, when it's actuated, it holds the two pieces of the P-clamp together and that holds the flex hose down uh, next to the truss elements to make sure that it's safe for launch uh, uh, vibrations. I also have a uh, high fidelity RPCM with me. Um, you can see it's got a single bolt interface on it. You can see about the relative size of it. It's pretty small, so we can carry it in our crew lock bag out to the work site. We'll be taking uh, the two RPCMs each in a separate crew lock bag out to the work site. Okay, that's all that I have on EVA 3. And we're ready for our EVA 4, so if you'd roll that video, please. Here we are on flight day 11, ready for our final EVA. The EVA crew members on this day are EV1, Steve Swanson, and EV2, Ricky Arnold. Um, they'll be egressing the Quest airlock and coming out for their first task, which is photographing uh, some damage that we have on the starboard radiator of the primary thermal control system. Here you can see there's a, a sheet of covering of that radiator that has pulled loose. We want to get good photography of that. This is a picture of our infrared camera or IR camera. We'll be using this camera to take uh, thermal imagery of the entire radiator. Um, both sides of that radiator. The ground will command a complete flip of the radiator halfway through so that we can get IR images as well as digital images of that radiator. The digital images must be taken during daylight, so we'll have to be careful about our choreography to make sure that we've got daylight available for at least a portion of the time that we are looking at that radiator. Then crew member Arnold will turn around and do the same infrared photography and digital photography of the port radiator, uh, again looking to see if any of the same kind of damage or delamination of the coverings of those radiators may have occurred. While he's working on that imagery, EV-1, Steve Swanson, will be translating out to the Japanese uh, um, portion of the International Space Station to the JLP and installing a GPS antenna or global positioning satellite antenna on top of that element. That GPS antenna will be used um, to provide redundancy for docking of the HTV um, logistics carrier, which is supplied by the Japanese, to the International Space Station later this year. You can see him here in the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory working on um, making connections for that GPS antenna. When he's finished with that task, he'll translate back over a little bit closer to crew member Arnold back on the Z1 element where he will be working on a patch panel reconfiguration uh, that will provide um, redundant power to the CMGs or the control moment gyros that are located under that large gray looking um, thermal blanket right in front of him. He'll be uh, attempting to demate and mate a connector that's been giving us trouble on a couple of the last missions. Uh, the ground controllers uh, have looked at um, the possible failures along with the engineering team. The engineering teams made several suggestions on techniques that may help to be able to move that connector. If that connector doesn't move, we've got a backup plan to go to the back of the panel uh, actuating some um, backup connectors to make those connections. When they're finished with the imaging task and the patch panel task, they'll go back to the airlock pick up some tools and some other equipment for the second part of their EVA, which was out on the S3 element. Here you see them in position on the aft side of the S3 element at a camera stanchion where the WETA, or wireless external transceiver 
assembly will be mounted to that stanchion. That uh, WETA will provide redundant communication for EV crew members uh, on later EVAs for the duration of the space station mission. When they're completed with the WETA installation task, they'll move on to the final task for this EVA. There are two more paths that need to be deployed on the S3 element. The first of which on this EVA to be com completed will be the outboard nadir PAS uh, or payload attached system. You're familiar now with the fact that the diagonal and sarge brace have to be removed before the PAS can be removed from its launch configuration. The diagonal and sarge brace reinstalled and then the yoke of the PAS brought down into position for attachment to the deploy clevis bracket. When they're completed with work on the Nader outboard payload attached system, they'll translate over to the inboard Zenith payload attached system location and complete deploy of that PAS as well. Both of these payload attached systems will be used on the ULF-5 mission to attach external logistics carriers that hold spares that could be used in the event that maintenance is required on external uh, equipment on the International Space Station. Again, the diagonal um, brace has to be removed. You'll notice that in this case there isn't a sarge brace. Those are only on the outboard paths of the S3 element. The diagonal brace is released. The PAS is deployed from its launch configuration inside the truss. The diagonal brace is reinstalled and then the yoke assembly can be reattached to the deploy <coughs> clevis bracket uh, with an adjustable diameter pin, a pit pin, and again the four attach bolts of the deploy clevis bracket. If they've been really fast on this EVA, they do have a get-ahead potential for deploying the fourth and final PAS on the S3 element. Uh, that one would be the uh, inboard Nader PAS. That's our final task for EVAs on STS-119 15A assembly mission. We'll have completed power reconfigurations cargo attachment operations, working with the international partners on the Canadian robot arm, working with our Japanese partners on configuring the GPS antenna on the JLP, and ready to complete uh, the rest of the IV operations for STS-119. That's all I have today on uh, details on the EVAs, and I'd be happy to take your questions. Okay, we'll start here with questions at Johnson Space Center, then move on to other centers if necessary. If you will, state your name and affiliation before starting your question. Uh, thank you, Mark Caro. Uh, I'm with the Houston Chronicle. Um, I'm, I'm wondering uh, what you're prepared or anticipating regarding the solar array deploy and what the uh, spacewalkers are prepared to do if there's problems. If, they do some of the things they've done on previous missions where they tried to assist, or have you changed any any thoughts about that? Well, we've, we're actually very fortunate to have all of the lessons learned, all of the procedures developed for all of those previous missions. Uh, we've published all of those procedures. We've trained in the NBL, Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory, to support all of those same kind of contingencies that we've had before. We also have a high fidelity uh, solar array wing. Uh, it's the engineering unit, uh, so we call it the E-wing. It's over in Building 9. Uh, that was used in uh, the troubleshooting on the last mission that we had uh, where we had a tear in one of the solar array wings. Uh, we uh, have all of the video from all of that uh, and uh, are quite prepared to deal with anything, anything like that. Uh, it's also uh, worth noting that 
The Falcons have uh, spent a lot of time uh, working with the uh, thermal engineers to determine uh, what kind of thermal conditioning can be done for each one of the arrays prior to its deploy to ensure that we don't have additional problems uh, and that we can, uh, can avoid some of the problems that we've had in the past. Uh, we've also had some problems with the, the way we initially uh, dis had planned to uh, deploy the uh, solar arrays back on the 4A mission uh, and have workarounds for all of those problems as well. Other questions? Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com. Just to follow up on what Mark said, um, I, in past they, they've had to sometimes um, make makeshift tools, uh, wrapping stuff with Kapton tape. Are, are you flying tools prepared already if, that, if the uh, solar rays need assistance already prepared and packed away? Several of those tools are still in configuration from the last time that they were used, already taped and, and ready to use should they be required. Um, the... Uh, the first line of defense for having those kinds of problems are the thermal conditioning um, changes that I was talking about earlier. So we'll be doing uh, special thermal conditioning before deploying those arrays to make sure we don't have those kinds of problems. Uh, we also have the Team 4 uh, ready and waiting uh, should we have any other kinds of problems that we haven't seen in the past. Uh, as we always do, we have a Team 4 ready to go to send to work over in Building 9, uh, working with all of the engineering community uh, here at Johnson, as well as bringing in experts from around the country as required. Anyone else? <laughs> Looks like that's the, oh, sorry, one more question here. Uh, Gina Sinceri, ABC News. Refresh my memory. Does the crew deploy? Will the crew deploy the arrays on this, or will that be done from the ground here? It's nominally ground commanded. Uh, there is a contingency override um, a, a mechanism that's on the solar array mass canister that, should the uh, command capability fail in some way, uh, or the drive mechanism fail in some way, that it can be um, driven with a. Uh, uh, the EVA override, we have trained for that, uh, and the crew members are prepared to do that. So we can do both. Mm -hmm. Okay, there are no more questions right now. And Johnson will go next to NASA headquarters for a couple questions up there. Thank you. This is Park Mellon from space.com and Space News. And uh, my first question is I'm just curious what the preparations would be if, if there were an anomaly that you'd have to go out. Uh, with a spacewalker, are, is there, um, I guess, plans in place to even add a spacewalker? Is there room for that in your, your busy schedule for this flight? Uh, on almost every mission, we carry a contingency day to handle those sorts of things, uh, as well as the consumables required to execute an additional EVA. So we have all of the consumables, uh, all of the additional uh, suit components, um, all of the um, Medox or um, uh, CO2 scrubbing capability available to us, additional batteries uh, charged and ready to go should we need to do another spacewalk. Uh, and then the mission control team has the option of uh, extending the mission uh, to accomplish a fifth EVA, or they can reprioritize the existing content of the four EVAs that we have. Uh, as I mentioned, a lot of the uh, work that we're doing on this mission is for uh, preparation of missions uh, that are several months away, the ULF-3 and ULF-5 missions. So they could defer some of those tasks even to the International Space Station crew themselves to be able to do another spacewalk another time. So we've got a couple of different options uh, on how to respond to failures. Thank you. And my last question is uh, concerns the, the S6 truss, because it seems to me that with once it's installed, uh, the, the, the truss for the station will be something like a football field in length. And I'm wondering, as a, a spacewalk planner, I guess, how, does that add any difficulty, extra, extra, extra cautions in how you plan uh, the work for these astronauts as they, they go from one end of the station to the other? Thanks. Uh, it certainly does add challenges, um, but we do have a great training facility at the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory. Uh, we have the entire 
a space station in the water at any given time. And we practice translations all the way out from the airlock all the way to the very end of the S6 and P6 elements. Um, we practice uh, contingency crew member rescues should uh, that be required. Um, we uh, start crew members in their early training uh, right as they uh, enter the program in their astronaut uh, uh, candidate training classes. Um, we immediately put them in to, uh, to, into the water and do training on all of the elements. So they get a lot of training uh, long before they're even assigned to the space station um, mission that they will be working on. Um, from a flight controller perspective, we uh, are always vigilant uh, wherever our crew members are to make sure that they are in a safe configuration. And uh, with one more element out there, it's one more element to know about. Okay, I think that was the last of our questions at NASA headquarters, and I don't see any follow-up questions here at Johnson Space Center, so that'll wrap up the STS-119 spacewalk briefing. Next up on NASA TV, we're gonna be showing the pre-flight B-roll, and then at 1 p.m. Central Time, we'll have the crew news conference. We'll see you back here then.